So I'm going to present probably pretty quickly the basics of PXE. Most of you have heard this before from me or have seen the website or heard from your doctor. Um, some of you are newer, and so this might be useful to you. Um, for those of you, if parts are repeats, they are with me, and um, it, I'll also add some bits about the where we stand with the research toward the end. So I think most of you know we founded um, my husband and I, PXE International, in 1994 when our two children, who are pictured here, if you do have the web access, you can see perhaps the, the um, slide uh, of my two kids when they were diagnosed at age uh, seven and five. Um, and then here they are today, Elizabeth and Ian. Elizabeth's an MBA candidate at George Washington University, and Ian is a web developer. In fact, he takes care of PXE International's website. Um, Ian's also uh, produced very recently a daughter, Maya, uh, and here she is moments after her birth. Uh, Maya and Ian and his wife are living with us for a couple weeks, so you may hear Maya in the background uh, as we go through today. Maya is a carrier of PXE since she has a parent with two mutations in PXE, of course. So Pat and I uh, discovered pretty quickly that there wasn't much going on and nobody knew anything about this disease, and it was pretty rough to have a five-year-old and a seven-year-old with it and not any information. And so what we did is we put together a foundation we called PXE International. Uh, we put together a biobank with samples um, uh, from uh, individuals with PXE. We created the test that uh, Larry referred to at GeneDX, um, and we licensed that test to GeneDX for $1 for life so that uh, they would share with us all the mutations they found and we could continue to aggregate them. Uh, we patented that gene when we found it um, because we uh, wanted to be able to uh, keep any university from locking it up, and so um, so we patented it. We published. We've also put together some clinical trials I'll talk about a little bit, and we're in the process of some uh, screening of pot potential treatments. So I think pretty much everybody knows PXE is a genetic disease. It's a systemic disorder, meaning it affects many parts of the of the body. Um, it's associated with mineralization, primarily of elastic tissue, and primarily the skin, eyes, and arteries. It's really not affecting other tissue clinically so much. Certainly, we can find it if we do a biopsy and look for it um, in many, many tissue, um, but for the most part, um, we are not finding it um, uh, clinically a problem in any other tissue except uh, skin, eyes, and arteries. PXE is a metabolic disorder um, due to mutations in the ABCC6 gene uh, that is important for transporting a substance out of the cell. So we don't know all the details of what it does, but it in fact transports uh, a substance out of the cell, and that's not happening in PXE, and so um, that is the, is the crux of the problem. The prevalence of PXE is about 1 in 25,000 to 1 in 100,000. We actually don't know the prevalence very well because there's no surveillance, meaning there's nobody kind of always adding up how many people have been diagnosed with PXE. And it's definitely more popular, more prevalent in places where there's a founder effect. Um, and those places are places that have been isolated in some way and people uh, actually come together um, and, and intermarry with each other because they have no other options uh, or limited options, and that concentrates the gene. And so we've seen that, for example, in South Africa, uh, where the Afrikaners, those are the French Huguenots and Dutch, married uh, in their own community and did not marry either African, uh, Black Africans or the British. Uh, it affects all ethnic and racial groups. We see it everywhere. And it affects women disproportionately, approximately three to two, and we do not know why that is. Occasionally, people suggest this may be because women come to us more often. Um, we don't think that's true because we've asked everybody that's affected to tell us about their brothers and sisters, and we still have a ratio of three to two. However, it is possible that women are diagnosed more often or know about it more often because uh, women go to the doctor more often, and so maybe we're seeing a skew that way. So a little bit about the genetics. There are two ways for disease to be inherited, and the first is recessive inheritance, and the second is dominant inheritance. In dominant inherit inheritance, only one person, one parent needs to carry the mutation, and the child can actually have the disease. 
That is not true in PXE. PXE is recessive, meaning that both parents, uh, both parents for all of you on the phone carried one mutation. And so your luck of the draw was that when your parents gave you the ABCC6 gene, they did not give you the one with no mutations, they gave you the one with mutations. And so because every person has two copies of the gene, your parents had one copy that didn't have a mutation and one copy that did, and they both gave you the copy with the mutation, just like we gave both of our children both times. Each pregnancy has a 25% chance of this happening, in our case, 100% of our children have PXE. That easily can happen um, because um, it's sort of the luck of the draw every time, like flipping a coin. Here's another drawing of that. If in the case of a recessive disease, the spelling, the mutation is um, wrong in one of the genes, there's no disease because the other gene overrides it and takes care of producing, in this case, the substance coming out of the cell in the case of PXE, there's mutations in both genes, and so there's no working gene, and so that lack of a working gene creates the disease. So we know PXE is a late onset disorder. Uh, it doesn't show up very young, although it's certainly we've seen it in babies, and my kids were pretty young, but in most cases, it's late onset. Um, there's variation in symptoms between and in families. So in other words, certainly between people, there's differences in how the disease presents itself. And even within a family, siblings can have very different looking disease. The reason for these differences are not known. And there's no association between a mutation and symptoms. So there's been a discussion on Facebook the last few days, uh, a couple people asking, if I find out my mutation, then will I know what symptoms I will get? The answer is no, we don't know. We actually did map about 250 people's mutations to their disease progression and, and aspects of their disease called phenotype, and we saw no association between those two. The gene was found in 2000 by my husband and I working in a lab late at night while our kids slept and the neighbors watched them. Uh, neither Pat nor I have any science background, but we did what is now called citizen science in those days it had no name, we just did it. The gene is ABCC6, and that comes from something called an ATP binding cassette family of genes, and it helps ATP release uh, from the liver cells. The liver cells are called hepatocytes, and without it, pyrophosphate is low. Now, this is a major, major finding. It's one that took us our almost 20 years to discover um, all this time to figure out what is different in people with PXE. Well, it is that your pyrophosphate level is low. So this lack of uh, excretion from their movement from the cells in the liver causes low pyrophosphate in your blood. And the immediate kind of uh, uh, anybody would uh, immediately say, well, then let's raise the pyrophosphate in your blood. Um, and we were told for about two years that's impossible, and I'll get to that in a second um, uh, because that turns out to be an important part of the story. So here's a cartoon of ATP being pumped out of the cell. Obviously, it doesn't really look like this, but just to give you an idea, uh, Pat, my husband, drew this lovely cartoon. Okay, so we know that PXE gets diagnosed, and probably most of you are diagnosed, by a clinical examination of the skin for the typical skin lesions, and we'll look at those. Uh, then often there's a skin biopsy to prove that, in fact, the, the um, elastic fibers are broken, and we'll talk about that. And then there's an examination um, of the eye for something called poteau orange and angioid streaks, and we'll look at those. Sometimes family history helps, so if a sibling has PXE and another sibling has an angioid streak, then it's highly likely that that person has uh, PXE. Genetic testing can help. Uh, only about 80% of the cases show up in a gen genetic test. We're now learning that maybe some other genes are involved, and it's important to exclude other conditions that have angioid streaks. There are a couple of others, although PXE is by far the most common condition with angioid streaks. So we look at skin and PXE, and again, most of you have seen this, so I'm not going to dwell on it. There are bumps on the skin. They're called papules, and they're pretty small usually. The papules then come together, that's called coalescing, to form plaques, uh, which are slightly raised lesions, greater than five millimeters. And then in more advanced stages, the skin becomes lax and forms loose folds. And we have some pictures of those. So here are papular lesions of the neck in PXE. 
uh, papules and plaques in the axilla, that's under the arm. There's laxity of skin in the neck, so you see some looseness of skin and these coalesced papules, uh, papular lesions and coalesced papules in something called the antecubital fossa, which is the inside of your elbow. Uh, and then axilla, which is the underarm, lax skin is very common there, uh, some papules there. And then not so often noticed, but certainly there a lot of the time is these uh, papules inside the lip, inside the oral mucosa. Sometimes dentists uh, per, uh, diagnose PXE because they see these. And then more recently, maybe about 10 years ago, we figured out that these chin creases are common in people with PXE. And actually, they're common in a lot of people. If you start looking for these, you see them a lot. Um, and, but we did notice that they were very common in people with PXE. And this is a biopsy of the skin. At the top of the slide is the top of the skin. And then we're looking down where PXE actually happens is the mid-dermis. So in this mid-middle dermis place, you see these broken up black clumps. And that's the elastic fibers broken and stained so that we can see them. Um, some people try to use creams on uh, PXE. It doesn't work because creams do not penetrate skin all the way down to this level. So there's no use in putting cream on other than for other reasons like dry skin, for example. So we turn to PXE in the eye. The major eye manifestations of PXE are potorange, angioid streaks, choroidal neovascularization, hemorrhage and scarring, and I'll go over each of these. So in this first picture, and again, if you can't see these easily, I will be sending you uh, a recording of all of this and you can slow it down and look at it more carefully. Uh, we're looking at peau d'orange. Peau d'orange is French for skin of the orange and this retina has this kind of mottled look that looks like the skin of an orange. So it has that name. Here's some more peau d'orange. We can see again, this kind of orange skin looking. Angioid streaks are grayish brownish lines that radiate out from the area surrounding the optic disc. They're called angioid because they resemble vessels and that's Latin for vessel, like blood vessel. And they result from breaks in the elastin rich Brooks membrane. So this Brooks membrane uh, is supposed to protect the retina from having the blood vessels beneath grow up into the retina and instead it's broken and um, I'm gonna sneeze, sorry. Excuse me. Um, it, it's broken and lets these blood vessels through. So here's some angioid streaks. Uh, we're seeing them come down. Uh, you can see the blood vessels are reddish and they're kind of smooth. The angioid streaks are grayish or brownish and they're kind of crooked or wrinkly looking. Some more angioid streaks uh, going in different directions than the blood vessels, which again are kind of smooth and easy to see. Um, this is an African-American fundus and so retina, so it's easier to see because it's darker. And then some more angioid streaks here, uh, cutting across these blood vessels that are smooth and growing in one direction. So this is a cartoon of a piece of the retina. Uh, we see it lifted up by these blood vessels and there's a bulge here. Uh, because of the blood vessels that are growing beneath, and this is called subretinal choroidal neovascularization. Lots of words to mean the choroid has some vascular growth, and this vascular growth is, is pushing the retina up. And now we're looking at those in the eye, so these little round balls essentially are places where the retina is pushed up. Again, now we're looking at it with a fluorescein angiogram, and that helps us uh, because it actually makes it quite distinct and we can see these balls quite clearly. We're in this picture looking at a scar from an old hemorrhage or laser treatment and I'll talk about that in a second. And then around the edge here where it's darkish, we're seeing um, some new bleeding. This we're seeing a lot of scarring. This white material here is scarring of the retina. And when we look at how do we manage PXE's eye disease, uh, we look at prevention, first of all, early detection, and then treatment as three ways to do that. And prevention, a diet rich in antioxidant vitamins might help. And the reason we think that's true is because it works for macular degeneration to some degree. And so we recommend to people that you take Occuvite or one of the, one of the vitamins on the, on the shelf in the, in the, in the store the drugstore pharmacy that says something about the eye on it. 
sunglasses. Every retina should be protected from the sun. The sun is very bad and does uh, bad things to even healthy retinas. Avoiding smoking is enormous. People who smoke lose their vision much faster uh, than anyone else. Smoking overall, we all know, is a major health hazard. It's even more so in PXE for lots of reasons. Avoidance of the Valsalva maneuver. So that maneuver is when if you're lifting something, you're kind of uh, holding your breath, you're squeezing really hard, your face is getting red, your eyes are bulging, that's causing uh, pressure to build up. And so Valsalva maneuver is something to avoid. This doesn't mean you can't weight lift because proper weight lifting with a good coach or a good advisor um, means you can do some weight lifting without doing what's called the Valsalva maneuver. And then protective eyewear with contact or racket sports makes infinite sense for everybody, but particularly with PXE, um, you can have an injury and then have a bleed. All of the things with asterisks are speculative, meaning we don't have data to tell us that's true. They're more common sense than anything else. So in early detection, we're looking at a comprehensive eye exam uh, to identify and ed educate patients who are at risk, regular use of the Amsler grid, and we'll talk about that a little, and then screening of relatives, siblings, to identify and educate people if they're at risk as well. And here you see an Amsler grid. Many of you have one of these probably. We used to recommend that you make this your screensaver and look at it on your computer every day. But we've since learned that in fact, the computer distorts it enough that that's a problem. And it's better to print one out and to put it on your refrigerator or your medicine cabinet door or somewhere like that. Um, and that will allow you to, to be checking regularly for something like this. So those of you who do have distortions see uh, the grid not clear uh, uh, perpendicular lines, but instead with some waviness to them. Uh, some people also report bathroom tile, uh, graph paper, lots of other things are useful for looking at uh, waiting to see if you have a distortion. There's a new um, app out uh, for the smartphone, for the iPhone or the uh, Samsung phone, Google phone, uh, and it's actually a prescription app. It's the first I've seen of this. The FDA just approved it about three days ago, and it's uh, at if you do a, a Google search of My Vision Track, uh, you'll find it. And if you can get your ophthalmologist to prescribe it, uh, the ophthalmologist can prescribe this app that actually does a test of your eyes regularly, as regularly as you want, uh, to test whether or not you're having a distortion. And they claim it's way better than the Amsler grid, and the FDA agreed with them, so it is now approved for use. Um, I, I haven't been able to get the complete lowdown on it. It sounds like it's moderately expensive, like $20 a month. Uh, the, the app is free. I downloaded it, but I can't get into it because I need a prescription. I don't have one. Um, so pretty interesting that uh, the phone may, in fact, be helpful. So treatment of the complications of the eye in PXE. Uh, so anti-angiogenesis therapy is the way to go. And I'm going to put up here some other treatments, and I'll read them. They are no longer used. Laser treatment, photodynamic therapy, and steroid injections um, are no longer used for PXE. Uh, they cause more problems than they solve. And the only treatments that are now used are anti-angiogenesis therapy. That's Ilea, Lucentis, Avastin injections. Now, there are still some people who call us and say, my, my uh, ophthalmologist wants to try photodynamic therapy because one of these injection therapies didn't work. And they certainly can go ahead and do that, and they do do that. Uh, but they do not find good results still from using those therapies. And I suppose some people think, well, the injections aren't working. I might as well try something else. One of the things people with these other treatments fear is that the treatment itself will actually take away more vision uh, than you'd want to have lost. So state-of-the-art in 2018 is we're using these anti-VEGF, anti-angiogenesis drugs. Um, they're standard of care in the U.S., they are not standard of care anywhere else in the world. And so in, uh, in most of Europe, all of Africa, Asia, South America, uh, people with PXE are not getting these injections. They're having standard laser therapy or photodynamic therapy because their doctors will not use these drugs are what are called off-label. Off-label means they were labeled by the FDA for macular degeneration. PXE is not macular degeneration. We can all argue that it is very similar and 
seems to be having the same effect as macular degeneration, which is what all the doctors in the U.S. do, and so use the medication off-label, but they won't do that in most of Europe and all the other continents I talked about. So it's just about impossible to get these drugs approved, meaning on-label. Uh, we did try. We went to Genentech, the company that makes Avastin and Lucentis, and asked them to do it. Uh, they would not do the trial because there's too small a number of people with PXE. It's too small a market, uh, and there's, we couldn't garner the funding to do a clinical trial. A clinical trial costs about $1 billion with a B, and we are definitely going to be facing a couple of those this year. Uh, and so we decided that we will just kind of ride the coattails of the macular degeneration community in the U.S., and then we're very worried about people in other countries but haven't been able to figure out how to get them access. So beyond skin and eyes, skin and eyes are definitely the most uh, affected uh, by PXE, but beyond skin and eyes, we see peripheral vascular disease, we see coronary artery disease, we see hypertension and cerebrovascular disease. Not as much as we see skin and eyes, but we do see these. The gastro manifestations of PXE are gastrointestinal bleeding, and we tell people to look for black tarry stool because that might mean a bleed. Very rare in PXE, only about 10% of people get a bleed, uh, but still um, a possibility. And abdominal angina, that's um, essentially feeling um, uh, a lack of blood flow after eating in the, in the abdomen, uh, and that can be quite uncomfortable. Um, Cerebral vascular disease, I think I skipped this one. Uh, no, I guess I didn't. Um, cerebral vascular disease and PXE strokes occur with increased frequency in people with PXE. Most of this is due to small vessel disease. Uh, dementia can occur if there are a lot of these. We don't see that a lot, but again, occasionally. And then aspirin and Plavix therapies uh, can cause increased risk of GI bleeding, and so some people don't use it, even though it will decrease the risk of uh, stroke. And what people have to decide is, would they prefer a stroke or a gastro bleed? Uh, given the choice, I would choose the gastro bleed since usually that can be uh, taken care of pretty easily, whereas a stroke could leave people with some difficulties. Um, okay, and I actually did skip. I wanted to talk for a minute about peripheral vascular disease, which is almost as common as everybody has skin Everybody pretty much has at least potent orange or angioid streaks in their eyes. Everybody pretty much has peripheral vascular disease, even if it's only slightly. What this means is diminished pulses in the arms and legs. It's that pain when you start out walking and it feels painful to walk uh, after a few minutes. The cure for it, the treatment, is walking, which is a very hard thing because you already don't feel like walking since it's painful, and what you need to do is walk. And so what we recommend to people is try very hard to walk because once you get through that, the blood actually builds its own new pathways and you have much less pain. If the pain is too great to get a walking program going, uh, then we recommend that, uh, in fact, people get a drug, a drug like Trental, uh, that will treat the, the, um, the peripheral vascular disease until you can get in a place where you can walk more, more freely. So in 2018, we know that PXE is a metabolic disease. We know the gene, ABCC6. We know that all cases are autosomal recessive. We know that pyrophosphate levels are low. And we know um, that these VEGF inhibitors, these uh, injections of antiangiogenesis, treat neovascularization. So we have some research to do. One of the things that's important right now is for us to test more people to see if their PPI, these pyrophosphate level, is low. And the reason why we're interested in that, and we weren't for the last few years, is because we were told when we went after figuring out if we could raise the blood levels of this pyrophosphate, that in fact pyrophosphate was not bioavailable. So meaning uh, you could give people pyrophosphate, but it would not raise their blood levels because it doesn't do anything. Uh, one of the things that we knew is that pyrophosphates are present in a lot of the food we eat. So it's a salt that's used as an emulsifier, and it's used to keep things together. So we see a lot of PPI, a lot of pyrophosphate in sausage, chocolate, Philadelphia cream cheese, um, uh, quite a number of things. 
And again, you know, we were told 50 years ago, a scientist figured out it's not bioavailable. When you eat it, it doesn't do anything to you. And so it can be freely used in food because it's not doing anything. Well, one of our scientists that we, um, that we fund thought, hmm, I don't really like the research from 50 years ago, and I'd like to just try this. And so he mixed himself up some pyrophosphate salts in a glass of water, and he drank it. And he had measured his blood levels of pyrophosphate before and after, and he noticed that by drinking the pyrophosphate, his blood levels went up. This was a eureka moment because it was overturning the dogma from 50 years of the FDA believing that it didn't do anything. He then administered, gave to his lab mates, all his postdocs and young scientists, uh, a drink of pyrophosphates as well, and they all experienced an increase in their blood levels of pyrophosphates. Uh, there was, seemed to be no side effects, uh, although he believes if he took it high enough, all salts like this uh, could give you diarrhea. So we will be trying a, a uh, trial of a small number of people with PXE to see if their blood levels go up uh, when we test them uh, drinking pyrophosphates throughout a day. And that trial will be done in Philadelphia because our center for PXE is in Philadelphia. Some of you know that from having come to our meeting there. Um, we'll be doing that sometime in May or June. Uh, where we'll ask some volunteers to come. Uh, we'll be choosing the volunteers from people who have filled out our big survey. Uh, and I'll talk about that survey in a second um, to make sure that we're choosing the right group of people. And then if this works, this again will be a small number, uh, we'll do an actual full-blown clinical trial uh, using pyrophosphates. The lovely thing about pyrophosphates, it turns out one of our board members runs the biggest um, meat processing facility for schools in America, Joe Moss. And um, Joe buys pyrophosphate by the truckload for very little amounts of money. Now, his pyrophosphate is food grade, meaning it's perfectly fine to put in food. Uh, we would have to go pharmaceutical grade, which is an even higher grade, and hope that we're not going to be having to spend a lot of money uh, making this a very high-priced drug. And instead, if it works, that it'd be a relatively inexpensive drug, maybe a powder that one could mix like Gatorade and drink it. Now, we don't know if any of that's going to work. And a question I often get is, oh, shouldn't I just start taking pyrophosphate right now? Maybe. We don't know, though. And if you do, you're ineligible for the trial, meaning you won't be very useful to figuring out whether or not this works. Um, you might also ask, have you tried it on mice? And the answer is yes. So we've taken our PXE mice, mice who have PXE that we've given it to them, taken their gene and knocked out the gene so they have PXE and they have low pyrophosphate levels, uh, they develop PXE. When we feed them pyrophosphates in their drinking water, they do not develop PXE. And so we have at least one mammal system that doesn't develop pyrophosphates when we feed them pyrophosphates. We know that there's a chain of events in the body with low pyrophosphate level it turns out that peripheral tissue, tissue that's not in the core of the body, starts to mineralize and that the pyrophosphate level being normal keeps tissue from mineralizing. Another question I often get is, oh, will this reverse PXE in people uh, who have already had mineralization like eye bleeds, et cetera, or wrinkly skin? The answer is no, it will not reverse it. It would stop or slow it down, which would be very useful. Um, but we are working on some other treatments that would potentially essentially have something called macrophages eat uh, the calcified tissue and renew it, uh, a common process in the body for tissue renewal. And we have a researcher in, at Vanderbilt working on that, uh, being funded by a PXEer who's donated uh, $100,000 for him to do these initial studies uh, in mice. So... We have a large number of potential treatments this year in the pipeline, four or five of them. They're all super expensive for us to be uh, messing with. In the old days, all we had to do were buy Petri dishes and get some skin cells and maybe create some mice. And now that we're actually at the level of looking at people, each of these studies is 100,000, 500,000, 500 million, $1 billion. Uh, so we're scrambling to figure out how are we gonna afford uh, this when our donations each year are usually somewhere around $50,000. So lots to, uh, lots to think about for us. One of the things we ask everybody with PXE to do is to fill out our large survey. 
uh, so that we understand the disease better because as we get closer to clinical trials, uh, the companies are telling us they're going to go do a different disease, not PXE, because we don't understand how the disease progresses and what might be a good measure of whether or not a treatment works. The reason we don't understand it is because we don't have data from everybody with PXE. In a rare disease like this, we need everybody to participate. We've had maybe about 500 people participate, but we have 4,300 people in the world. And for some reason, most of them uh, don't want to participate, and we don't know why. Uh, so we've actually hired a full-time person to try to figure out why and also to do the survey over the phone for people who have trouble with the computer. Uh, but we're sure that the 3,000 something people who are, haven't answered it aren't just afraid of the computer or can't see. Uh, we think people are just not taking the time. And that's tough because uh, we do need everybody to answer this survey or at least uh, 50, 75% of the people. So our survey looks like this. You come to a homepage on our homepage. It's right on the front. Uh, you have a guide take you through a couple things if you want to, or you go right to the survey, and the survey essentially is quite simple, asks you questions, gives you feedback while you're answering, so you get to see how you stack up against everybody else with PXE, uh, and there's a lot of questions. Um, takes about two hours, uh, but again, we need this information or we won't be able to do these clinical trials. Our website, I think most of you know, is pxe.org and has lots of information. We're in the process of redoing it, so if there's something that you'd like to see, let us know, and we'll try to put that together for you. Um, and that's all that I have now. Uh, for now, what I want to do is we do have some time uh, to open up uh, a discussion if anybody uh, wants to um, ask any questions. Uh, the last thing I'll say is we are having a big in-person meeting again this year. We try to do it every other year because it's too expensive to pull off every year, uh, but it'll again be in Philadelphia. Uh, on, oh, let's see, September, we have posted the date, so if I just look at my calendar quickly, I keep getting this date messed up when I read it out, so I'm going to actually look at it, uh, the 28th to the 30th, so September 28th to the 30th, um, yes, so that's, uh, that's when the meeting will be.